So thank you, Leila, and thank you, Jane, for having, having us here, having me. Um, those of you who know the Culture and Rights uh, publication know that I did not edit that alone. I edit that, edited that with Jane and with Richard Wilson. And it's really a pleasure to be here and to, in a sense, you know, reconnect with uh, Jane's amazing capacity of bringing a number of people together in a very congenial and very uh, stimulating way. So thank you for being here. Um, thank you also to my former PhD student, Suzanne, who, with whom I'm, we, we are working together on this paper. At the moment, it's very much a working paper. So um, possibly take what I say with a little bit of a pinch of salt. I will be delivering it, but um, Suzanne will be also happy to answer questions. So um, as you can see, I've used the word petition in, uh, we have used the word petition in the title. And uh, that's because um, we're going back a little bit in time. My area of expertise is the European Court of Human Rights. And in fact, at, in the original uh, text of the European Convention on Human Rights, the word petition appeared. So it said that the commission, which was the filtering body before a case could go to the European Court of Human Rights, so it was called the, the European Commission of Human Rights, may receive petitions addressed to the Secretary General of the Council of Europe, blah, 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 blah. Now, it's, to me, it's really interesting that that word petition appeared. Um, we've heard that yesterday, but you know, there were a number of international mechanisms in the early 20th century which did use the word petition. And when Sudan and I were reflecting upon it before this workshop, we were kind of thinking, well, this idea of petition, you know, you are in this position of the supplicant or of the person who recognizes the, the, the power of the people you are, of the people or authorities or institutions you are addressing. And I think there was something of that kind because, you know, as, as uh, all of us human rights lawyers teach our students, the European Court of Human Rights is the first mechanism ever in the world where uh, an individual can make a complaint against the state uh, for anything, but in this case for a violation of human rights. And so, you know, we teach that, but in fact, we are not quite right, because in fact, the individual could not make a complaint against the state. The individual could petition the commission, and then the commission might have taken the case to the European Court of Human Rights, where the, the person, the, the alleged victim, would not appear. So that also um, you know, resonated with what you were saying yesterday. And I mean, the, 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 overall, the overall aim of the system of the ECHR was really to try to avoid another war, possibly also to avoid communism, to kind of come into Western Europe, but really to, to, to kind of kill any attempts by states to fall into dictatorship and to kind of go the, the wrong way and to lose democracy. And so, in a sense, the, receiving these petitions was a means to an end. But the aim was not, you could say the aim was not so much the protection of the individual, even though that's what we say, but the aim was to maintain peace in Europe. And I think a consequence of that is that the, 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 these, these individuals, which would, which would turn to the mechanism, when are not the raison d'etre of the system. The, the, and so the raison d'etre is, is to keep peace and so they, they, these, these individuals can disappear, which is what we see in the procedure to begin with. The, the, the it takes quite a few years before the applicant can actually even have submissions brought to the, uh, to, to the court. Um, 
the later phrasing, I would expect it's from 1998, but I'll have to check that. But I expect that it, well, it's protocol 11 for the, for the specialist. But um, then the work petition disappears. We talk about a case, we talk about an application. Actually, the commission itself disappears as well. Uh, that's when the, the, the commission is phased out. Um, for the purpose of this presentation, as you know, in a sense, what what one of the things that Jane was interested in is uh, the the life of these petitions, and as you said, they may have a career. And we're going to have a, a wonderful example with a, a, a case from the Inter-American Court. But before I go into that, continuing on the European Court of Human Rights, one thing which interests me, and that's again from the very beginning, I'm, I'm quoting the 1950 document, is that. Um, if the Commission accepts a petition, referred to it, it shall place itself at the disposal of the parties concerned with a view to securing a friendly settlement of the matter. And I want to talk a little bit about what these uh, friendly settlements were about. Um, <coughs> well, basically, the idea was that if the friendly settlement succeeded, between the parties being the, the, the petitioner and the defendant state, what would happen is that at the end of it, you would have a brief statement of the facts and of the solution which was being reached. So a solution might be that um, the uh, petitioner would, would, would receive some money or would, would, would uh, yeah, um, a number of things, but, but, but money comes into it quite a bit. Um, what Article 47, well, what Article 47 also <coughs> says is that the court may only deal with a case after the Commission has acknowledged the failure of efforts for a friendly settlement. So there was an obligation, in a sense, to try to get a friendly settlement, which I think is also quite interesting, because the, 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 this was this view that really, you know, we don't want to work the boat too much. Yes, we, we, we want disputes to be resolved, but let's hope that by the end of it, everybody is happy with everybody else, and that we have what is called in law a friendly settlement. Uh, in the new text from 1998, with uh, a number of revisions since, but nonetheless, uh, Article 39 of the ECHR still talks about friendly settlement. The procedure has a little bit changed by now, so now it's at any stage that there can be a friendly settlement. Um, the proceedings which lead to the friendly settlement are confidential. And then what becomes, uh, if, if they're successful, the, the, the case tr is struck out. That's the same as before as well. And as before, um, you just have a statement of the facts and of the solution reached. Um, and Knight says that the committee of ministers can be involved in, in, in supervising the execution of the friendly settlement. But, so it's more or less um, the same thing. Uh, which, which, to me, the, the, the big change at the moment is, is that this can happen at any stage. Now, the Urban Court of Human Rights was, uh, came into being in 1957. Um, so from 1957 to 2017, uh, the number of friendly settlements we have had is just ob above 1,000. These are friendly settlements which are written in a judgment. You can see that the total number of judgments was 20,000. Um, and uh, from these, the, the highest number of uh, friendly settlements come from Italy. That's because of the length of uh, judicial proceedings. It takes a, so there are a lot of cases of violation against Italy uh, because they just take too long to to deliver justice. And then Turkey, the UK, France, 
Portugal, Poland. Now I thought I would also tell you the lowest number, which is zero, and you can see a number of, um, of countries, but there are also countries where there is only one or there is only two. So I suppose what, what I'm telling you is that there is a huge var variation in, uh, in how, in a sense, the, the, the cases are distributed uh, in Europe. Now, total number of judgments for this period is 20,000, oh, 20, most of which at least find one violation. Um, no violation, you, you, you don't have many. You only have 1,600 judgments which have found no violation. So it might give you the impression that everyone, everyone wins at Strasbourg, but actually that would be the completely wrong uh, uh, conclusion to make because what you need to take into consideration is that only a minority of cases end up in a judgment. And here I'm giving you for 2017 alone, we have had, the court has completed the examination of over 85,000 applications. So what, me, what that means in practice is that most cases are declared inadmissible and they never, they, they don't go into the annals, they don't go, they, 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 they are being destroyed after one year, they don't exist in the archives any longer, but that is really the normal fate of an application uh, in Europe. Leila, can you remind me when I started to talk? Yes, it's been 15 minutes. Okay. So, um, a few more statistics. Uh, 2015, uh, you can see how many friendly settlements there have been uh, in 2015, 2016, and 2017. And then what is interesting is that <laughs> something new has appeared, which is called unilateral declaration. And basically, a uh, unilateral declaration is a little bit like a friendly settlement in the sense that there is an outcome which is not inadmissibility, which does not go to a full examination of the merits and a judgment. But instead of being a friendly settlement, which is formally agreed by the parties, it's a mechanism where the state has said, we would be happy to have a friendly settlement. We offer this. We offer money, or we offer uh, um, a, 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 an administrative document, or we offer something. But the applicant says, well, actually, I'm not interested in this. I don't think, I don't think it's good. You are not recognizing that you are violating the convention anyway. Um, you're not giving enough. We refuse the friendly settlement. And then the court comes in and says, well, the applicant is refusing for no good reason. It's a unilateral declaration. We accept the declaration of the state and we struck out the case. I can see a number of you's eyebrows are going up, kind of thinking, well, what's going on here? Uh, which is, of course, what scholars who are aware of it, because most human rights lawyers actually only look at judgments. They don't look at anything else. <sighs> You know, critical human rights scholars are saying, well, what's going on here? Now, um, I think there is only really one book on friendly settlements, uh, which has been published in the Europe, friendly settlements in the European Court of Human Rights. And it's been written by one uh, professor and two younger scholars. Interestingly, the professor since then has become a judge at the European Court of Human Rights. And what they basically say about friendly settlements, the, the overall, their overall conclusion is that it is a rather uh, uh, problematic mechanism uh, because, first of all, you know, there is no need to recognize that there is a violation of the convention. So basically, there is no public acknowledgement that something has gone wrong which must be changed in terms of a general measure. It may or may not be satisfactory to the applicant. The applicant might be quite happy with what they receive, or they might not realize that actually it's not quite good enough. 
In terms of migrants, they might get they might receive a three year residence permit. You don't know what happens after the the three years are over and the case is the case is finished by then. Um, and they also say it really monetarizes human rights because basically it's a matter of receiving a little bit of money and then getting getting out. So um, I would say it's also extremely pernicious in the sense that to manage to get even to the state where uh, the case is not inadmissible, as I've told you, most cases are inadmissible, takes a lot of resources from um, uh, at least if you are, you know, my, 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 last, our, my last book was on migrants, but you know, for migrants and geos to, to manage to get a case which is not inadmissible uh, is it, quite tough. And you need first to have, uh, um, to have exhausted national remedies. So you've already had to have uh, uh, put a lot of efforts into the judicial system and obviously you've been refused domestically otherwise you would not go to Strasbourg. So it's a lot of resources and then suddenly the, the state sees, oh my god, it looks like it's not going too well for us here. We'll give a little bit of money and the case disappears. So um, I would say uh, very problematic. So we could finish the, the presentation here and say oh, how terrible friendly settlements are, except that um, I would like to turn now to another system, which is the inter-American um, uh, system of human rights protection. And as you can see in this picture, uh, there has been, they are interested in friendly settlement uh, but what we would argue is that in that system, friendly settlements, even though they look the same procedurally, <coughs> are being implemented in a very different way. Uh, so this is a report, I, I, the, 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 this picture here, I think it's a report of 2017 or 2018. I have forgotten now, but it, it, it's, it's, it's recent. It comes from the uh, organization of American states where the uh, Inter-American Commission of Human Rights and Inter-American Court of Human Rights are part of. It's a younger mechanism than the European system. It's always said that it was inspired by the European system, which is obviously true. We, we find more or less the same provisions. Uh, at, at surface level, they are really the same. Uh, I would say that uh, when you look further into it, the rather different mechanism. Now, in that report that I have just shown you the picture, they look at the impact of the friendly settlements that they have adopted. And they look at a number of different categories. And here you can see that uh, th that's the category non-repetition measures. So basic, basically measures which have been adopted so as try so, so as to ensure that the, the problem, the violation, would not be repeated again in the future. And so uh, they, they're looking here at laws which have changed as the result of the friendly settlement or the adoption of public policies. And we want basically to talk to you about one friendly settlement which had to do with migrants' rights, which happened to be Suzanne and my area of expertise. And this, this part of the, the presentation is really based on one chapter of Suzanne's uh, PhD. So um, this friendly settlement came into a case which is called De La Torre against Argentina. Uh, basically, this Mr. De La Torre was uh, Uruguayan. He had been in Argentina f as, a, as a regular migrant. He was a legal migrant for a while, and then I don't, I don't know the details of it, but he became illegal. Um, and in November 1996, he was detained and then expelled and deported from Argentina. 
In December 1996, even though he was not in the country any longer, uh, lawyers took his case to the Argentinian uh, judicial system. And uh, it went through uh, at, at two levels. Um, and basically, uh, the, the, the lawyers didn't get what they wanted to have, which would have been that the expulsion had not followed due process and that there was no appeal. And uh, again, I don't really know the details of it, but I probably get the gist. I'm probably giving you the gist, yeah? Hopefully. Now, um, so it goes through the Argentinian system, which is always you know, one of the, the conditions to, to go to these international human rights institutions. You first go nationally, and then you can turn internationally. And in 1999, the lawyers petitioned the Inter-American Commission. So a case starts there, and um, takes a little while, and, and then in uh, October 2003, the, part, the commission, the Inter-American Commission, and the, 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 the parties, being uh, De, De La Torre's lawyers, who are not in contact with De La Torre any longer, so it's an NGO who is doing it, in a sense, for the, for, for the good of, the, of migrants' rights in general, rather than for the individual. In, uh, in question, and the Argentinian government decide to start the procedure to get towards a friendly settlement. They get through nine working meetings, so they, they meet nine times, and they eventually uh, conclude a friendly settlement in 2009. So what I'd like you to, to keep in mind at this stage is that the friendly settlement starts in 2003 and is concluded in 2009. So these are two important dates. So, uh, oh yeah, um, I, won't get, I won't get there, but I think to me it's quite interesting that the friendly settlement, as it's then being written, it's of course brief, you, you have heard that it needs to be brief, but compared to a uh, uh, friendly settlement in the European system, it's of course at least four or five times as long as, as, as it, because it has far more details in it nonetheless. The impact is that uh, that's taken from the Organization of American States own report. So what they think this impact, the impact of this uh, settlement has had is that it has had a decisive factor in the repeal of the so-called Videla law. The Videla law is the law from the dictatorship about immigration, which basically gave uh, no, virtually no rights to, to migrants who were being ex expelled. So um, that law was being repealed and was replaced by uh, by, by the model of, uh, of immigration law who you would find in the whole world if you want to look for a human rights-based immigration law. So the Argentinian law is considered by migration scholars as, as the, 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 the best example of what you could have as a migration law if you care about the human rights of migrants. So if you, co if you consider migrants to have a right to migrate, and w once they are there, having uh, quite substantial protection. So the OS says um, the friendly settlement was a decisive factor, because basically uh, the, the Argentinian government accepted that something was wrong with their way of treating migrants and accept and want it then to do to do something about it. It also says that it was key to uh, Argentina uh, uh, ratifying the convention, the international convention 
on the protection of the rights of all migrant workers and members of their families, which is kind of one of the new uh, UN convention, human rights convention. It's to do with migrants. It doesn't have a very high level of ratification in the world. And then it also says that it had a far-reaching effect in uh, managing to get civil organizations to be represented in an advisory commission whose role it was to adopt the regulation which would make the new human rights-based migration <coughs> law uh, implement it in the country. Um, very often when you have a law, you then need to have a regulation which kind of gives the, the, the nitty -grit, gritty uh, implementing measure. So it says it had a far reaching effect in uh, influencing that process. And then it also says that thanks to it, you know, there, there was a suspension of immigration inspections, the, the detentions, uh, um, uh, uh, came to an end, etc. So it's a beautiful story, basically. This friendly settlement had such a great impact. Now, we can take a little bit more of a, uh, of a kind of say, well, maybe they go a little bit far in what they are claiming there that the impact has been, uh, because actually, you know, um, the compliance was actually more partial than that. And even the, the Inter-American Commission itself recognizes that. Um, even so, you can say, well, it was quite a, a fantastic story nonetheless. Now, I think it's important to realize that this friendly settlement only had an impact because there were other factors also allowing that to happen. And, some of these factors are that the human rights overall discourse and practice in Argentina um, you know, has, has, taken, has taken up uh, following, you probably know about the mothers and grandmothers of the plaza. So um, that has had an effect in the overall context in the country. There were also, there had been beforehand cases to the inter-American system. And so the road was already there and the lawyers knew how to play the system in a sense. Then uh, with apologies for the spelling mistake in uh, Nestor Kishner's name. And also that was a, not an election, but it was when he took office. But, you know, Kishner became the new president and he was interested in pushing for human rights and to make a break with the dictatorial past. So he was, he was ready to, in a sense, collaborate with the Inter-American Commission, even though lawyers would have said there was no case to answer. I mean, the guy was not even there any longer. It should have been declared inadmissible, which is something the government said. They said, you have no case. But nonetheless, they negotiated with the commission and the lawyers for the friendly settlement. And then, you know, the, the, there are other uh, uh, minute po politics, I won't go into that, but there was also, there was also the, the political and social crisis of 2001, when basically the finances of, of the country collapsed, and there were a lot of Argentinians emigrating. And so there was a, a, a context where migrants were also the Argentinians, and they wanted to push for the... Um, uh, protection of migrants in general. So it's not the friendly settlement alone, but nonetheless, um, it had a contributory part to play. So who wins when you have a friendly settlement? Um, sometimes the state. I mean, basically, in the European system, it's, it's quite clear that the state can quite like these friendly settlements, and they're not quite between equal parties. In the, in the, the latter case, well, we can be more uh, 
did the state wins or not. I mean, basically now the Inter-American Commission is even saying we cannot close the case because you've not, impl you've not done everything that you needed to do. While you can see that they were really asked to do a lot of things and that in fact the, the impact of the friendly settlement already happened before 2009, before it was concluded, there were already been an impact. And so the poor Argentinian state today um, finds itself being told that uh, it's, not, it's not done its job properly. Uh, so that's interesting. The petitioner, I mean, De La Torre didn't know it was happening. In the European system, you could say, well, possibly. I mean, it depends on individual cases. Uh, the, the commission or the court, I mean, the commission uh, in the Inter-American court seems to be very much wanting to, to do it still for in a human rights kind of uh, ethos. In the Euro European court of human rights, friendly settlements have become a management tool. It's another way of trying to get rid of as many cases as possible, whatever the human rights implications. So I think that is uh, quite problematic, but the court likes it because the court says, we are a victim of our own, uh, our own success. We have far too many cases. Actually, I should have said in the inter-American system, you know, the, the number of cases are nowhere near what we have in the European system. So it's really uh, things which at surface look the same, but once you dig into it, are very different. And then, of course, there is uh, the, the, the very, uh, does human rights law win out of these uh, mechanisms? You, you will have heard that I have a particular opinion on this. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs>